Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to LD at School's second webinar for the 2020-2021 school year. My name is Susanna Miller, and I will be your moderator this afternoon. If anyone is experiencing any technical difficulties at this time, uh, please contact us using the Q&A box at the bottom of the screen, um, or you can email info at ldao.ca. After the webinar, we'll be sending out presentation slides, a follow-up document with links to additional resources, and a link to a survey to provide us with feedback on the webinar. In approximately three weeks, the webinar recording will be available, and we'll, we'll send that link out to all participants. So this is what I was talking about before. This is how to communicate with the LD at School staff during the uh, webinar. There is the Q&A box. You can see we're trying out a different platform today than usual. Normally we would be on uh, GoToWebinar, but we've heard so many good things about Zoom and we want to make sure that we're offering you the best possible product. So we're going to be trying out Zoom during this webinar. Uh, there will also be a question in our survey to see how you like this webinar compared to our previous ones. So we'd really appreciate it if you answer that, those questions. Uh, at this point, all webinar participants have been muted for the remainder of the presentation. Uh, this presentation was entirely based on questions submitted by our audience. Once our presenters have finished their presentation, we'll be opening up the floor to any additional questions. So over the course of the presentation, if you have any questions you'd like to ask the LD at school team or our panelists today, you may enter your text in the question box and submit it to us. The LD at School team is very pleased to welcome our guest speakers, Susan Alcorn McKay and Martin Smith, whose presentation this afternoon is entitled, Teaching Students with LDs Online, Engagement, Work Completion, and Evaluation. The Ministry of Education has provided funding for the production of this webinar. Please note that the views expressed in this webinar are the views of the presenters and do not necessarily reflect those of the Ministry of Education, nor the Learning Disabilities Association of Ontario. We will also be tweeting throughout the webinar, so if you would like to participate, you can send us a tweet by using our handle at LD at school or the hashtag, hashtag LD webinar. If you do have questions, you can also submit them by replying to any of our um, our Twitter posts as well. So that takes care of the housekeeping aspect for this afternoon. So we're going to get started. It's now my pleasure to introduce our speakers. Our first speaker on the panel today is Susan Alcorn McKay. Susan has been working in the field of special education at all levels for the past 35 years. She's currently retired as the Director of Counseling and Student Support at Cambrian College, and she continues to teach in the LD program at Cambrian. During the years since this program was implemented as part of the Learning Opportunities Task Force in 2002, thousands of students and their educators have benefited from these modules directed at students with LDs through learning strategies and assistive technology. Susan has also developed and delivered online additional qualification courses in special education for Nipissing University and is a member of the LDIO Provincial Board of Directors. A frequent speaker on disability issues, Susan focuses on practices that work and support learners with a wide range of disabilities within the educational environment. An author of a children's book, The Turtle Connection, Susan also has contributed to other education, educational publications as a researcher and poet. Our next speaker on the panel is Martin Smith. Uh, Martin is the English language uh, educational consultant for LDAO. He has over 30 years experience as a classroom teacher, music teacher, administrator, and system principal for the Hastings and Prince Edward and Greater Essex District School Boards, as well as experience at the Provincial Demonstration Schools branch. Martin has facilitated workshops at a number of educational conferences, including Quest, the Educators Institute, and ASSET. 
He was a member of the Eldiot School Advisory Committee for five years and served more recently on the LDAO Board of Directors. Martin is a strong advocate for all students and supports school-wide data-driven strategies for addressing learning needs. So welcome, Susan and Martin. The cyber floor is now yours. Thanks, Susanna. Um, are we going to be putting video on or are we just going to keep the screen with the slides? Uh, that is up to you. You can join us with your faces or not. It's totally up to the speakers. It'd be great if you could put our faces up there. Sure. Um, uh, and I'm just going to get started. So on behalf of uh, Susan and I, uh, we'd like to thank you um, for your time today. Um, we're looking forward to uh, a great 45 minutes or so of learning. And uh, we have a lot to share with you. But just before we get started, um, there are some thoughts that I wanted to share with you on behalf of Susan and I, just to kind of set the stage for what's going to happen today. So we're, we're coming at this from the belief that um, all of us are lifelong learners. And uh, that's what we hope uh, to instill in our students. Um, and I would say that probably most of us have, have pretty well developed philosophies of teaching, whether you know, you're in your first couple of years or whether you're getting long in the tooth uh, like me who'd been at it for many, many years. But it's a good time for us now, I think, to, to come back to that philosophy and, and maybe adapt it to this current situation that we're in. I'm sure most of you know that trying to digitize what you do in your real classroom isn't the answer right, for this online learning. What works in a classroom, um, the techniques that you've relied on with students in the past don't necessarily work in the online teaching environment. Many ways, it's kind of like trying to shove that square peg into a round hole. And that's why it's important, I think, that we slow down and we reflect a little bit on the work that needs to be done and how best to do it. And this is particularly important when we're dealing with students with learning disabilities. So remember that each of these students are going to have unique needs and challenges. And oftentimes, the challenges and needs in the classroom are going to be different than what they are online at this time. So part of what we hope to accomplish today is take time, just relax and reflect a little bit on what you're currently doing and how you might shift some of your thinking and your practice to better accomplish some of the goals um, for your online formats. When planning for students with an LD, you know that many of the strategies that work for those students are good for all students. You remember that old saying, good for all and necessary for some. So Susan and I, we get it. We understand you're busy. We know you're overwhelmed and we know that you're working really hard uh, to try to learn some new technologies and uh, adapt to what's going on. Um, I was doing some reading about online learning and I, I found uh, some thoughts of a teacher uh, who'd been uh, reflecting on, on their philosophy of teaching. And I really liked what she had to say. She said she's really shifting from a, from a big, long, written out philosophy to something that was a little more focused for online. And that was concepts are crucial. It's about the big ideas and the overriding expectations. Process overrides product. And finally, relationships are the most important. Um, and that's the key to true engagement. These are sort of the, the, some of the things that we'll be talking about today. I would like to emphasize that we are not the experts, but we really do hope to share some ideas, stimulate some of your thinking around these issues, and we certainly welcome your questions and your expertise through the journey. So with that, I'm going to turn it over to Susan. Thanks, Martin. Uh, I, I, I have to echo exactly everything he said. Uh, in putting this together, we were really cognizant of the fact that we don't have all the answers. Nobody does. These times have come upon us. Um, so what we were looking for is for things that people have said that they've tried and that they've shown to be successful in their situation. So we're hoping that some of these uh, ideas, you can take a piece of them. Uh, you might see one and say, no, that won't work for me. But if I changed it like this, it might. Uh, or maybe it'll get you thinking about another way, then we'll, we will have felt successful today because it's mostly supporting you in trying to make the decisions that will work for you in your situation today and tomorrow. We won't go too far down the road because who knows what tomorrow's gonna be. Uh, so the, the first part is, uh, is organizing the classroom. And I, I, used, I was in a BA program too, and I teach teachers. 
and I know how much time you spend as a teacher setting the stage, getting your classroom ready, getting the learning ready and the structure ready. And it's been totally thrown out the window for you all right now with uh, very few exceptions. So I, I'd like to, to suggest that you start with the structure first and really try to plan uh, how you're going to do the structure of your lessons online for your students in your group. And uh, so these are advices or things that people have said so far since September that have worked for them. And one of the first ones is to follow the same structure every day uh, so that students log in to one place and they know the sessions or the topics that are going to happen each day, that it really helps them to have a sense of structure. Another one is to try to offer a, a larger choice for assignments. You, you, it's totally different. You no longer have the opportunity to uh, present one way and to monitor it. So whenever possible, considering that their home situations are all different, uh, it, it's really critical that uh, you try to provide them with as most, as the most choice as you can. Uh, that will still give you um, a result of the curriculum. Uh, try to include a range of different activities for the students uh, because you all know that they all learn differently and they all have their preferences. So it's not to do one to the exclusion of others, but try to offer a range of activities uh, that is going to give them the opportunity to choose the ones that are going to work for them today. Try to get them up and away from the computer. We all know that. And how hard is that to plan? I mean, uh, I know there's people have done some amazing things with making balloons and doing jumping jacks and setting them on scavenger hunts, all kinds of things to try to get them up and away from the computer. And I think this is one area where uh, your creativity and your students' creativity will really allow um, you to, to think of some opportunities for them. And movement breaks are really, really important. Um, not just to stand up or to move around a bit, but to get their brains engaged in the next uh, activity. I just had a couple items, Susan, that I wanted Please. to add in um, around the organization of learning, um, particularly for students with learning disabilities. Just, just a reminder that the IEP is really sort of that core document in terms of planning for the individual needs of that student. And um, that really occurred to me that how difficult that can be when you're not even in the school to get into the OSR or make sure that you know you have access to all of those documents. So it's really going to take some, I think, some creative thinking on how we 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 do business or you know working with with um, with people at the education center or at your board office to make sure. Um, that, that you have access to those documents. Uh, things like visual schedules, timers, um, the daily lists of things that need to be accomplished are all really good tools for students with learning disabilities to keep them focused throughout the day. And of course, you'll probably hear me say this many times, talking to the student themselves, especially when you're getting into grade seven, eight and uh, secondary, Students with learning disabilities very often have a very good and clear understanding of their needs and strengths as learners, and they're going to be able to help you organize learning in a way that really works for them. And I guess at the end of the day, ask your students what they want, what activities they prefer. That, that's probably going to help you out the most. Uh, making the personal connections. Um, I have a grandson who is doing online learning and he raves about his teacher and how she makes learning exciting for him. And I'll tell you, this was not, this is not the kid that you would have expected this to work for. <laughs> we all shook our heads when we heard it was going to online. And we said, I don't know how this is going to work for this darling boy I love, but who is not going to sit in front of a, a screen and learn. But boy, his teacher has really struck the chord and now he gets up and looks forward to logging on. Um, and, and another thing that, um, that teachers have said uh, that it's really important to get that one-on-one -on -one time outside of instruction. The instruction they can plan for, but the kids with LDs or the kids with difficulties uh, who need to have that engagement, that they really need to have some uh, instruction time, some of them especially, uh, and you'll know who they are, uh, who would benefit from specific responses to you. It would be really nice if you could bring um, selected students in to work with the spec ed teacher or the educational assistant. And I know this would be some 
structural or um, difficult to organize in some ways, but I think once it gets started, if your EA had a list of students and contact information and could set up uh, some one on one time, whether it's uh, 10 minutes or an hour or whatever they're able to do that the work with one student uh, could really pay off. And one teacher found this herself and she told me about it and she didn't think it was going to work either, but she just asked that student after class just to meet with her and she explained a concept to him one on one and she said that's all she didn't have to do another thing for two weeks with him. He was able to fully engage in the classes because of the quality of that one on one little bit of time that they had together. So I know that's a difficult to plan and you've got logistics to work out. But I think once you can do it with a few students one on one, uh, you'll really see how that's going to help them out. Uh, you could schedule an intervention meeting and that can be with any student, but the ones with LD or, or any kind of exceptionality are the ones who are going to need a little pull aside whether it's for five minutes or 10 minutes, and when possible, work with students and parents. And I know that's a big challenge. And for some of you, that's not going to happen. But when it does happen, it can be really exciting and really fulfilling. Susan, I just wanted to add a few things there. Just, you know, this whole idea of, of the relationship is, is what really ensures the buy-in um, in, into the program. And I think those relationships are something that need to be tended daily. And some of the, the things that we've been thinking about is, is saying how important it is, particularly online, um, to check things like your body language and your, you know, your, your comments or your smirks and those kinds of things, uh, because those can have such a detrimental effect uh, because your face is plastered right on that screen all the time. I know Susan is doing her best not to giggle while I'm talking and, and appear professional, right, Susan? And, um, but, and you're uh, not th laughing are... at my time. <laughs> yeah, so, <laughs> uh, so these are things I, I think that, you know, that we, it's a different way of thinking because the dynamics in front of a regular classroom are so very different. Um, and you are able to see your students and, and make those connections in a very different way than we do it online. So um, the other part that I wanted to mention was that in terms of building the relationship more than ever now also I think getting to know students interests are so important because that's going to be crucial in terms of getting the buy-in. Uh, students are far more likely to be um, to be engaged in work that they're personally interested in and you know it's 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 hard to maintain that. And the final comment I wanted to make, I see people are making comments online and I, I just want to say how much we appreciate that. There's a comment made that of course IEPs are available in, in pretty much all boards across Ontario electronically. So um, keep, keep those things coming. Um, uh, I, they're really helpful for us as, as we go along. And I've had teachers tell me that they've got access to the IEPs and I've had teachers say they don't. So it, we also recognize that what works for one person in one city might not be the same in another board. Uh, so, and for some, it's, we were supposed to do 10, e, uh, 10 I, IEPs this semester so far, and we've got none done. We've got no access to this, no access to that. So uh, we recognize that in many cases, you're flying by the seat of your pens and trying to work out with your student what's gonna work for them. Absolutely. Okay, next one. Um, the whole online environment, and I know September was way better than last semester at the, at the end, or the last part of the year, but so many students still don't understand the basics of online instruction. And I know you say their parents help and sometimes they make it worse. Um, but some students with LD are really telling us that since they found out about the microphone in Google Docs, they don't need a scribe anymore. All they have to do is, is talk out their answers and then they want to be able to talk it out properly. So the whole planning that goes before you start dictating. But I think that's a really important feature uh, that some students are going to need direct instruction in. Whenever possible, uh, make short how to videos to help them with the tasks. Uh, a bunch of teachers already told me this that they were struggling to, to just have the most basic how to do an email, how to do an attachment to email. Um, how to submit assignments and then what they were talking about was they were complaining to their colleagues that they didn't have time to make all these videos and somebody said well I've got one on making email attachments how about if I share that with you so they ended up sharing a, a lot of little how-to videos you know that were a minute and a half or a minute to 
in life and life for their own students. And so it's just a little reminder that you you need to go sometimes uh, that step beyond and create a just in time tool that's going to work for your students and not necessarily wait for the glossy beautiful one that your board's going to produce in the fullness of time. And um, also with online, especially to have a wide variety of choices in assignments, uh, especially with your kids with LD, some who can't write very well, but they can do a video. Uh, some who could do an audio just fine, or better yet, a demonstration uh, where you set them on a task and they go uh, within their home and within their tools to create a demonstration that they can video or describe or, uh, or show you in some way so that you know that they have understood the concepts. Martin, you got something there for us? Just a thought around uh, the videos, Susan, I know that um, very often you can also use your students uh, to make those videos. And I keep coming back to mm -hmm. saying that, you know, I, I think about a lot of the, the students with learning disabilities that I've dealt with over the years. Um, just a reminder that that it's learning disability is not an intellectual disability. So their their intellect is intact. And very often those are the students that have really strong tech skills and would just love to be helping out. Um, making those kinds of tools um, to, to help people, you know, on the way. So, so there's, there's lots of, I think we have to get, get, get it out of our head that we have to do everything ourselves. We do have lots of support. Yeah, that's a good point. Uh, now the whole question of how to um, engage students and, and these are directly from uh, the questions that you folks sent over the last week or so. And one of the basic ones is how do you engage students in the online platform? Like how, how much more simple and basic can it be? Because you you try so hard to engage students every day. Um, and so some people uh, were saying that it really helps if they keep everything in one classroom so that they're not searching around and the students aren't getting discouraged so that they're staying engaged by going to the one classroom rather than going through a, a bunch of separate ones. And I know you all have different setups and different boards and different ways of going, but wherever possible, try to keep it all in one. And again, follow the same structure every day. Um, how do you keep their attention from waning? Well, you, you could probably put a list up of challenges that you've had, um, but again, offer the variety of, and choice and assignments and activities, try to use what your students are interested in and let them go with their interests and do activities away from the computer that are that are more aligned with their interests. Uh, one teacher told me that she was sending them on tasks where they had to go around uh, their household and collect various things and then bring them back and order them in a certain way. So it, it's kind of working with what you've got. You know, I think one thing that, that we really have to remember is that um, online uh, teaching changes the interaction that happens between, you know, clearly between a student and a teacher. And we know that there, there's a loss of what they call that physical proximity effect. So um, when you're in the classroom, you are far more in tune because you're, you're typically wandering around the classroom, you're able to check in, look over students' shoulders. It gives you a much better sense of who's engaged and who's understanding. But when you're online, that proximity can often create confusion because um, very often it frees the instructor up um, to be more focused on content, right? So you, your, your head goes down, you might be working off notes, you might be looking at your computer screen at the slides that are up, and you start to really, I think, lose, um, you, you lose that contact and that engagement with the student. And for that reason, I think it's very important, again, for the LD student especially, to make sure that you're going back and you're checking, you're checking for understanding, you're, you're finding ways to use, you know, exit card strategies or something to know what's going on to help you slow your instruction down to make sure that everybody is with you and, you know, and they're progressing at the rate that you hope. Uh, I was just looking at some of the questions um, and, and there's one, Martin, I don't know if you have a, a, a thought. Uh, it's about the union doesn't recommend turning on the camera. Not everyone is, is comfortable with turning on the webcam. Any recommendations for building relationship without webcams? That would be a real problem. 
I don't think you can build a relationship without no. a webcam. I think your students need to see your face and you need to see your students' face. Um, I, I'm, I'm not sure that, that I was aware about that recommendation not to turn the cameras on, um, but I, I don't know how you could <laughs> do it without. Yeah, I don't either, especially not with the younger grades, um, maybe in high school, but even there, I think uh, the face-to-face -face with the teacher is, uh, is pretty critical. And the whiteboard or whatever the tool is that the teacher is using is pretty yeah. important also. So I, we actually, uh, we had a great suggestion from one of our um, audience members. She says a bitmojis really help. So those little animated mm -hmm. pictures of yourself. So, you know, if, if you're not having the camera on at all times, at least there's like a little reminder of you as a teacher and it creates that a little bit of connection. Yeah, and then I, I, also, I also think that, you know, even if your students aren't willing to turn on their cameras with the whole group, that might be a time when you go into a private conversation with them or pull them into a breakout room and try to do that one-on-one -on -one moment. But I, I'm sorry, I'm retired, so I get to disagree. It has to be <laughs> anytime. Face. And I see that from Eloise. Yoo-hoo, I see that it's in, in students' IEP starting now saying the cameras have to be on. We expect the kids to be on with us and to be engaged. Um, and I think a camera, a camera shows engagement, right? And I mean, it, I mean, you're not going to wear a hood when you're in the classroom because you're scared to show your face. So I, I would say it has to be on in the classroom. Otherwise, you cannot expect the kind of engagement in learning. And I don't want to get too controversial here. I think we, <laughs> we need to keep moving. But um, it's, you know, it's, I think that's, that's certainly something that, that people will have to, to give some good thought to. And I understand, too, that some, some parents, some families won't have a camera. There, there's not a camera in the house. There's there's nothing they can do about it. I had to go out and buy a camera. I didn't have one. And I've been working online uh, with online instruction for, I don't know, 20 years. So I do understand that as well. But as long as the teacher has something on, uh, and like you say, the bit emoji or the cartoon or the, the picture or something, so that when students are looking at the computer screen, they're seeing something. Uh, so even if they can't, have a webcam to broadcast themselves, um, at the very least, the teacher needs to have something pictorial that's, that's gonna be up there. Yeah. Um, the, the third point on this slide is supporting executive function development for students with LDs on an online platform. I mean, we can talk about learning, we can talk about content, we can talk about the things they need to learn, but they also need to learn how to learn. And it seems to me that that has been really kerfuffled by this whole environment, uh, but yet they need to, that direct instruction. I think that's something that your your EAs can really help with as well. But if you look at, um, and we've given you some resources, online resources for executive function development tools that the students can do and will enjoy doing and the families can do with them as an extension. Uh, there's all kinds of games that are built on executive functionings, planning, thinking, organizing, in a fun way, uh, I think that's uh, that's something that you can do with a little bit of research and knowing your students, uh, and that would be a way of really bringing in the family to the whole structure of it, and building in short the choice boards for in class and out outside learning time. And a lot of teachers have told me that they're building small groups, like two or three students, um, with a similar profile or with a similar need and giving them, allowing them as a group to choose something from their choice boards and then working on it and then coming back to the group. So I, I think that can be a very valuable uh, approach as well. Great, I want to talk a little bit about um, executive function. <laughs> it's really, it's really um, hard to stay focused reading all the comments. They're, they're really interesting. Um, so I'm, if you see me sort of spaced out, that's, that's what it is. I've, you, you kind of wish that we could engage more with, um, with everybody out, out there. So keep them coming, it's, it's getting me really confused. Um, but in terms of executive function, um, I know um, we were saying lots, lots of us used board games in the past for executive function. You know, it's a great way to help with skills um, like 
turn taking, like um, um, impulse control organization, things like that. And so obviously that's that's not available now, but there are a lot of online board game options. And, you know, another option I know is that um, working with parents, and I think Susan, you mentioned that already, but but if 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 you're recognizing executive function skills that are lacking in students, really what needs to be done initially is they need to be identified and they need to be taught, right? That that has to be kind of a direct instruction piece, and it's good for everybody, whether it's done whole class or in small groups, um, identifying uh, those executive functions. And you know, Lori Faith has a lot of uh, work in that area that's that's certainly worth exploring, but. Um, you know, working with that executive function. And then if you're able to reach out to parents, and I know this is probably more for the younger students, but to to recommend activities, it could be anything from baking to uh, crafts to board games, things like that, um, to help support those if parents know exactly what skill you're trying to work on. And the, the online board games, I think another great way to keep students engaged um, and working in partners, because we know that social piece is so, so very important. So just a few ideas um, around that. Uh, there's also some really good online things. Um, a couple that come to mind, one is called PlaySpent. PlaySpent.org is, uh, it's an American uh, site, but it, it works, uh, it's, a, it's a game on poverty. It's a game on managing money. Um, another site, uh, commonsensemedia.org, unfortunately another American site, but um, really working with digital uh, citizenship and digital literacy. A lot of the activities there are, um, are, are things that students work on individually or work on in groups. So I'm just saying it's, a, it's an opportunity to move away from you know, just the Zoom lecture and, um, and head them off into areas where they might work together. And yeah, they're, they're appropriate. A lot of the sites, particularly Common Sense Media, I think that's a really great site. You can actually select your activities based on um, the age or the grades of your students. They come with all kinds of lesson plans. Um, you know, it's not replacing curriculum, but it, it's certainly uh, supplementing a lot of things that are going on. Uh, sorry, Common Sense Media. The one before that was playspent.org. Just a simple game, um, helping students learn a little bit about how difficult it is to manage money and, the, and you know, and, and about poverty. So I'm just thinking, you know, these are just kind of activities that can be done quite simply and individually, and then to bring them back to discuss or talk about it afterwards. I've been reading the comments too. I, I really wish that the 400 of us could have a dialogue, <laughs> but, but we can't. Uh, one of the comments that really caught me is about being cautious not to push uh, a camera on kids with anxiety or with difficulties. And I couldn't agree more. And that comes to you understanding your student and understanding what they need and engaging with them in a safe, comfortable way that you can maximize learning, but also their comfort. And so I would say that for some students, there will definitely not ever be a request for them to go on, the, on their camera um, unless they ask for it, or unless they say like one-on-one, -on -one, you're showing them something, can we go aside to the private classroom and we can just chat? Maybe then they will, because you can learn more from looking at them, but maybe they won't. And, and I wouldn't push anybody to turn on their camera if they're not comfortable doing it. I think you should have your camera on or, or some, something so that they can relate to your face and to your expressions and to know that you're fearless. Um, even though you may not be, you have to act that way. Um, but I wouldn't force anybody to turn a camera on if they were not comfortable doing that. But I wanted to make sure that was clear. Um, differentiated instruction in a, in a classroom for students with LDs, absolutely critical. You all know that and you all try to do that in your classroom now. The virtual classroom, if, if there are definitely challenges. Um, you have to really think and be present and deliberate about hearing the assignments, group work, independent projects, all the kinds of things that you know that are going to engage them, yet allow them to show or demonstrate that they understand the curriculum. And I think that's a, a very big task for you. And I think along with that probably goes to not paring down the curriculum, but focusing on the essential, that you don't have the essential and five nice twos. You've got to have the essential only. We, you don't really have time to branch out and do more, except in 
certain cases where that's already possible or already planned or the students already show it. But uh, keep it to the essential learning and try to find different ways for students to, to show what they're doing. And don't forget universal design uh, for learning. Mm -hmm. It's, uh, you know, obviously that's that should be guiding you as well in the differentiated piece. We could do a, a webinar on universal design for learning, I bet. <laughs> uh, this is, um, Martin and I agree, uh, we have some real concerns about uh, participation marks. And I know there's a big push to get kids to participate online so that you know they're learning, you know they're there, and they're not asleep at the desk. And I think we have to be extremely careful uh, about the whole participation approach online or offline, because many kids with learning disabilities or other exceptionalities have a great deal of difficulty verbally, part verbally participating or, or setting themselves out. So you, you need to know your students really, really well and understand that if you're going to allow participation marks, which <clears throat> I'm not fussy for, that you've really thought it through and really done it carefully. Um, for instance, a student might not put up their hand or participate online, but they might have an email to you later or have a little voice chat with you later uh, just to show further interact with you. <clears throat> You want them participating in learning, not necessarily the verbal environment. Uh, and then there's all kinds of ways to respond, little polls. There's all kinds of little uh, computer uh, software for polls during, before, after a lesson. Uh, and if you must do participation marks, if, if it's mandated or you have to do it, use a low grade, a low weight grade. It shouldn't be a big participation mark. And there should be a clear rubric and it that shouldn't be all during your instructional class that you expect them to do it. And also uh, overall grade several times to provide feedback, not just like once a month or once every six weeks. There should be many frequent smaller um, uh, participation assignments if you're going to if you're going to grade them. Martin, you're, oh. you're you're heating up the comment board there. Susan. Oh, am I? Oh, but no. I bet. Oh, well, it's, and, but I think, you know, in, in fairness, it's really the conversation is is exactly what I see a lot of people saying. It's it's not about participation marks. It's it's about marks for demonstrating understanding. Right. And yeah. and for for trying. And I think so. That's why the, the question mark is there. And that's what we were saying is um, I think this is really addressing a larger question of saying, how do we how do we get students engaged? How do we get them to persist participate? And uh, I think what you said right at the beginning, it's about, you know, it's it's engaging activities and it's good relationships will make students want to um, to you know, to participate and to be engaged. Uh, the one caution that I do have is that um, we have to remember, again, I keep coming back to this, you know, so many of our students with learning disabilities may have processing issues, may have issues with taking in or, or getting out information. So what may appear to be someone who isn't participating, maybe someone who requires more think time, maybe someone um, who is having trouble because the content is moving so quickly, written or verbal content that they're not able to take it in in an appropriate way. And you would hate for that to be mistaken for somebody who wasn't engaged in learning or wasn't trying. So again, you know, it, it just speaks to going back to that IEP and knowing the learners and, and finding other ways to know um, if, if they're understanding. And I think that comes back to a, a little bit of conferencing, some individuals, small group conferencing, or ways to check for understanding. I agree. We should do have lots of comments. <laughs> that's cool. Uh, I see Kahoot mentioned up there. I think that's a fabulous product or a fabulous approach. Uh, kids love Kahoot, generally speaking. Uh, work completion. How can we, and this came right from one of you teachers, how can we be more in tune with the students' struggles when teaching online as they so often give up and don't communicate? And that's true and you, you've all got examples of that. Um, and I don't wanna put more work on you or suggest that you're now gonna call all your students every day as well as teach them every day. But some students might 
then if you had a, a little time every day to make a couple of phone calls, maybe, I don't know, two or three or, or whatever, depending on your class, that would probably be a good idea to be able to check in with the student via phone or email or right after class, just stay with me online and just like have a little chat with you. Uh, so, so that you have an opportunity to get some feedback from them on, on how they're finding things. Uh, try small groupings for after class activities and um, always provide choice and activities when you can, understanding that there's some difficulties with that too. Um, another just, big question uh, from many of many teachers is how are you going to help them organize their assignments? How are you going to help them organize their day? So they're able to work after class and on the stuff that you want them to have for the next day. But without that ability to reach over and check their agendas or to make sure they have it written down, it is more difficult for sure. And so that's another opportunity for direct planning. And I think if you can work that into your schedule and into planning to help them organize that, it'll make it easier for everybody. Um, you can have a class calendar that they can also have their own personal part that only they can see, but you have to teach them how to do that, of course. If you can provide a list at the end of the class with clear expectations, uh, I don't know if, if that then you could send that to them um, or so that it stays up in the classroom so that they can check it or if there's a, a place that you can actually write that on their room or on their board. Uh, make sure they know how to contact you with a question and that's going to be different for different students, different teachers. And regular Google Meets outside of instruction time to create a positive rapport. And these are all very individual ideas and some will work for some of you sometimes and you'll just have to figure out what works for you and your students today. Over to you, Martin. Yeah, just, just a, few, a few thoughts. Um, I think, you know, this idea of alternate delivery methods and, you know, equivalent activities are, are really important in terms of uh, addressing students' struggles. So, for instance, if you're, you know, if, you, if you're working with data sets and you're, you're describing data sets in text, um, when you could be using pictures or graphs, you know, those kinds of things help students with different learning modalities understand in a different way. Um, and it's, I know it's difficult because we always feel that we're under time constraints. I say, as I keep picking, peeking over at the clock to see how, how we're doing, but um, you know, it's sometimes again, it's that sitting back and saying, is, is there another way to present this information? Um, another thing that came up again, specifically for LDs is to say, um, are, are you aligning their, their learning or their text with their, the cognitive load that they're able to handle. So um, particularly, at, well, and for any grade, I mean, if you're, if it's a reading assignment, are we ensuring that if a student has got a reading disability, that um, whether they're using assistive uh, technology to help them with that, or they have a text that is simplified to make it faster for them to get through or easier to understand. Uh, so, you know, just those are some of the, the bits and pieces that I think, you know, we, we really have to think about. Um, the other part in terms of work completion that, that I've read a little bit about, it comes back to that whole piece that in a regular classroom, you have so many hundreds of interactions in a day, right? There's all sorts of things related to, um, to, to your, your facial expressions, your body language, little interactions with kids that could be very subtle or, or not. And that we have to rethink again how that works online. Um, because uh, we, we rely on those interactions to really get that deep understanding of the students that we work with. And I think that, that there's a lot of thinking that needs to go on around how do we replicate some of those interactions online? Are there ways that we can, we can do that to, to keep building those connections that we need to really understand what our, what our students need? Next slide, please. A big one that is causing a lot of controversy, of course, a, a lot of difficulties for you all is how to evaluate the students uh, and how to make sure they've uh, grasped the material before you evaluate them. Nobody likes to give a failure, an F or a very low mark. And I think uh, the evaluation is gonna be different online. It, it just, it can't help but be. Um, 
you're not going to have tests that you walk around the aisles up and down and observe the student writing and make, giving them a little hand or a little help if they need it or, or, or any kind of that just in time thing. So I think it, the more you can get away from evaluation online with all those challenges, the better. Um, lots of ungraded practice options that are that would be really good so that the student with LD has a chance to do it over and over and over again. So when they're gonna do it to be graded, it's just gonna fall beautifully out of them. Um, assess over time. I think the days are gone where you have a summative evaluation that like we all did at university. The final exam covered the whole curriculum of the whole course. Uh, and it was meant to make sure that you could remember everything. Well, I think those days are gone. Our students are not going to remember everything that they've been taught because there's so much. There's just so much. They're not going to be, but they need to know where to find it. That uh, That is a better skill for them, I think. So assess over time rather than the summative, uh, more frequent assessments, uh, and try to make the final tests as unnecessary as possible. I'll consider assignments, and these are the higher level assignments anyway, that demonstrate or describe. Those are the assignments that are going to really bring out the quality. And it's also going to make sure that they're not copying. If they're demonstrating something that they've worked with you to decide on, on the topic, and they're using the things that they can find online or at home to create a demonstration, it's, they're going to be one of. So they're not going to be copying other people's things. It's just going to make for a better uh, environment all in all. And I'm, I'm going to look forward to seeing your, your comments uh, about the successes you've been finding with evaluations online. I'm hoping there's some. I think that brings us right back to where we started, Susan, um, with the idea that concepts are crucial and process is more important than product. Because I had the same thoughts. Um, you know, how do you submit product online? Uh, you have to, you know, if particularly when we're thinking about hands-on projects and bits and pieces, certainly you can do it with video, you can do it in other ways. But really what we're looking for, I think, is an understanding of, of process. And finally, the last piece that I wanted to add in terms of evaluation, we just added, um, there's a resource document I think that everybody has um, access to and I hope you've been peeking around in that a little bit. There's an interesting article um, there about uh, nine assessment techniques and um, I would just encourage you um, to have a peek at them because you probably know most of them but there may be one or two that you hadn't thought of. It's anything from online polls to open-ended you know assessments. We already talked to think about uh, Kahoot and Quizlet and things like that, drag and drops you know, using forum posts. And in that article, um, it, it's connected to, you know, to some sort of corporate learning website or something, but it does have uh, links to where you can figure out how to do this stuff, whether you're doing it in Google Forms or, you know, whether you're how to create a Quizlet or a, or a Kahoot. So for anybody who isn't familiar with that, it takes you right back um, to, to some of those pieces and, and, you know, gets you just thinking about that evaluation piece again. And Susan and I have been talking a little bit about, you know, that whole cheating and, and you know, just going online for answers. And I think it really begs the question about what is it then that we're evaluating, right? If it's so easily found on the internet, do is that what we need to be um, assessing our students on? Or are there ways that, that we can really assess their thinking and learning in other ways? Uh, Martin, they're looking for the, uh, the document that uh, references multiple assessment types. Is that in the resource document that we're providing? I, I believe that it is. Yes, it is in the resource document. And I will be putting the link to the Padlet into the chat as well just okay. right now. Just give me one moment. It's already there once, but I'll put it in again. Perfect. So I think that brings us to the final slide. Is that right, Susan? Yes, it does. We're, we're, and we were told in no uncertain terms to be done by 4.30. <laughs> and it's 4.35. You follow That's directions very all. well. <laughs> we still gave you time for wrap up. So. There's plenty of time for wrap up. So thank you so much, Susan and Martin, for the answers you've given us so far. I do want to just touch on the chat right now, like you said, is kind of going crazy. I will go through all of that and uh, capture all the hints and tips and tricks that teachers were sharing there and compile it into one document and send that out tomorrow as well. 
Um, but in the meantime, I we do have time for a few more questions. So if anyone in the audience does have a burning question that they want answered, please put it in the Q&A box. It's a little less uh, busy for me than the chat box right now, so it'll pop right up to the front. And um, Susanna, I just wanted to mention yeah. also, I'm not sure if we said it already, but we, we've been also been having some discussion about maybe running a few more of these sessions. Um, there, there was such, this was, um, came together very quickly um, and I think a very timely uh, topic, obviously. Um, we've been reaching, or I've been reaching out as well to, to some of the, the people that I know that are in, involved in um, administering uh, the online or the virtual schools in boards. So we're trying to make sure that we have current information. But um, I'm assuming that people might be interested in, in looking at a few more of these. And I think they could be driven by some of the questions that come up um, by the participants today that we could be a little more specific or we could also look for some other presenters that might have some more specific knowledge so feel free to um you know put your ideas in those boxes for us yes of course and um if you don't have time to send us your ideas today please do the the survey that cut sent out tomorrow it helps us a lot to plan future webinars and if you would like susan and martin to come back or another sort of question answering webinar just let us know there's a box to to request new resources in that survey and just let us know and we'll try to meet all your needs so i do see a few more questions coming in um one of the first ones what do you do for students who need to disengage because the online learning platform is too busy, it's too overwhelming for them? I think that's where the personal relationship between the teacher and the student uh, might come into play. And if the teacher can uh, work one-on-one -on -one with the student for a little bit, maybe they can get them organized and get them de-stressed so that they'll be able to join in. Uh, maybe they're going, depending on the age of the child, it might be really important to get the parents to uh, make sure there's a structure. Um, I know some parents have hired a person to come in and, and watch their kids if they're working. Uh, they, they don't help with the online, but they're there to support the kid. Uh, so work is, maybe it's not the parent, maybe it's the, the person who's monitoring that at home. It'll be different for all of you. Uh, but I think it's going to come starting from the teacher working with the child one-on-one -on -one to try to uh, get them set up in a way that's going to work for them. I would also say that that um, pretty much all boards in Ontario right now have an actual admin team that's overseeing the virtual school. So even though when we had in-person learning, there was still the virtual programs going on. And I would say that there there should be, um, you know, sort of some some best practice or some understanding around those kinds of issues because I know that they're happening everywhere uh, and they're they're not they're not easy to solve because typically I think you know if a student it's kind of two issues one a student who is unable to respond well to the online environment and the other one who doesn't engage in the online environment right mm -hmm. and very often I think both of those can be related to home issues so um, there certainly are big ones but we can look into that more uh, for sure. I was concerned about the uh, the question um, about the student being exempt from online learning <clears throat> based on anxiety, all the personal circumstances. Uh, I would think that would be an extreme example, and you might need the special education teacher, uh, maybe the board psychologist. They would have to be a team together to meet about that student and about their circumstances and see what could be done, if anything, to uh, support their learning. All right, thank you. Um, then we've got some questions that are kind of age specific. Um, one for secondary students. How do we support students in the quadmester system where the curriculum is moving really quickly and it can feel quite overwhelming to students? I'm just laughing because I saw that question. I was like, please don't ask that one. Please don't ask that one. <laughs> I only ask the hard questions. I know. It's so, I mean, I have a number of friends in the in the secondary panel and I and I hear about this, that the quad mester, the oct mester, whatever they are, you know, the struggles that are going on in there. And I, you know, I don't have great, um, great advice for you. The only thing that I keep going back to is to say, I think we just really have to focus on, on the, the big ideas, right? And 
the, the problem is that people are so diligent about trying to move through the curriculum and specific expectations and those things. And we, we really have to take that step back and say, you know, we're, we're in the middle of a pandemic and we're in an unprecedented time in education. Like there's nothing to compare this to. So all my, the, the work online that I've been doing trying to prepare for this, um, all of the research right now that I'm finding about online education refers to online education that is um, choice, right? So people who have who are taking an online course to to at their uh, because it's an option that they've chosen to do. So that there's really there, there's no precedent for this. There, you know, we're in a time when everybody is being forced to do this, right? On top of all the other stresses and bits and pieces around work and home and kids there. Um, so I think we need to give ourselves some permission to step back a little bit and say, you know, we're, we're doing the best that we can. And I think some of the best thinking around that is to say, if you're in a quad master and an op master, whatever they call them, you, you can't think like a classroom teacher anymore, right? You're, you're starting to think more like somebody who's organized a day long conference or, or a different kind of learning environment where we're trying to plan around small bits of time where we can um, you know, focus on, on certain points, give time for consolidation or for some exploration or for some project-based learning, those kinds of pieces. And we did have- I just want to- uh... To, to finish my, my part by saying, uh, we're really focusing on, on what works. Uh, and many of you are having challenges, but you've got to remember that for some of these kids with LD, this online learning has been a godsend and they're doing very, very well. They're able to focus, they're able to get the help they need. Um, and I think one course at a time has been wonderful for some. And uh, I, I think we should look at the fact that there could be so many positives coming out of this as well. Yeah, I think that just underscores that every student with LDs is different and you need to understand your learner because some, yeah, some love the focus of having one subject at, the, mm -hmm. at a time and others just can't keep up with the pace. So I think one last question, let's get one for the teachers of younger students. Um, what would you do if a, a younger student doesn't have anyone at home to help them engage and maybe help self-regulate a little, um, what would you suggest teachers do? Well, for, from my perspective, I don't know that there's a whole lot the teacher can do, uh, except reach out to the parents and highly suggest that there be somebody at home. And I know that that's often a big ask, but somebody has to be home uh, for the period of time that the students are on in class or maybe the mornings only or the afternoons only, whether if it's a relative or a friend or something, because for some kids, they need that structure and somebody to say, it's nine o'clock, you have to log on. And if they can't do that, well, then the teacher can't do anything because the student's not there. Um, so I think then reaching out to the parent uh, is about the only thing you can do. I don't know that there's any other magic. All right. Martin, did you have anything to add to that? I just, um, I think I, I, I was thinking about it a little differently, Susan. I, I hear what you're saying. Um, I was thinking it, maybe it was more about, you know, the student who was having trouble engaging with, with the learning, not so much getting mm -hmm. to the learning. So just a different, but um, it also, it, it's not, uh, it's probably more questions I'm asking, but something Susan and I talked about as well is, um, so in a typical school, like in an elementary school, you may have some other supports around spec ed or EAs, you know, even board supports that come down to help students who are having trouble engaging. And I was curious out there <laughs> to light up the board again, but to say, you know, what is happening with EAs now with with virtual learning? Because I'm I'm really not sure. And what's happening with that spec ed team? Would you be able to access that as an elementary teacher to say, I need some time for one-on-one, -on -one. so I may be doing a reading lesson, or I may be doing, you know, a, a social studies lesson with a large or a small group. But but this this one, you know, is is not able to function. So in a typical class, the a EA may be using proximity or working one-on-one -on -one with that student. Are they able to do that 
um, online as well. And I'm just trying to read these. Yeah, there yeah, it, it so seems I, to be. Yeah, some some are having good success yeah. and some aren't. So yeah. my answer would be to you know to try and explore some of those things in the way you might in a regular classroom as well. Yeah. All right. Well, I think that's all we have time for today. Um, unfortunately, I think we could keep this conversation going for hours and hours and hours. Um, but we do have to let you get offline and, and you know, go home, take care of your families, eat dinner, those things, <laughs> all those fun things. So um, we are still available to answer your questions, though. So if you do have any further questions, please either email us at info at ld at school.ca or use our hashtag on Twitter um, and we will endeavor to answer all your questions. So the questions that weren't answered today, I will be collecting and we will be using to inform future resources that we put out. So every question is helpful. And I just want to let everyone know to mark their calendars for our next LD at School webinar, which will be taking place on Tuesday, February 9th. Um, our presenter is Sarah Terberry, and she will be presenting The Road Ahead, the Undergraduate Learning Experience for Students with LDs. So after today's um, webinar, you will be receiving the slides, the resources. I will be creating an even a secondary resource document that's entirely built by the audience here with their tips, tips and tricks. And you will also get a link to register for this um, upcoming webinar. The link to register is also on our Padlet if you've gone to see that. So on behalf of the LD at School team, I would once again like to thank Susan and Martin for their amazing help today um, and all of our participants for joining us. Uh, please remember, we'll send you all the resources tomorrow, slides, handouts, survey, links to the Padlet, everything you need will be in your inbox tomorrow morning. All right, well, that's all we have time for today. And thank you again for participating and enjoy the rest of your day. Thanks so much. Thanks for spending this time with us, folks. Yeah, thank you very much.